congratulations to the Greater Buffalo Sports Hall of Fame Class of 2019. Now, from the Buffalo Niagara Convention Center, welcome Master of Ceremonies, Paul Peck. Well, hi, everybody, and welcome to a night where we celebrate the history of sports in Western New York. This is the 29th Annual Greater Buffalo Sports Hall of Fame induction ceremony. My name is Paul Peck, sportscaster, voice of the UB Bulls, and host of Beat the Champ. It is my honor to once again be your master of ceremonies. I get to share the stage with these amazing individuals who have guided us, taught us, inspired us, and always reminded us what is good about sports here in one of the great sports towns in all of America. this year have hit the line in first place, scored plenty of goals, touchdowns, and baskets as they starred in the sports of skiing, ice hockey, field hockey, football, and basketball. They may not have all played in front of 65 or 20,000 people, but they have inspired way more than that. And that's why their names and legacy will live on forever in the Greater Buffalo Sports Hall of Fame. They're all winners, and we won't apologize for that. So, so let's, let's meet the class of 2019. This Husky He-Man won three state titles at Oleans High School before adding two NCAA championships at Penn State. We never wrestled with the decision to induct Jeff Prescott. She was a leader of the Max Attack as a star at McKinley flew high as a Louisville Cardinal, and now lays down the law while looking good in black and white stripes. Welcome basketball star and official Dorothy Jones. A legend of Lancaster who played there and coached there for over 40 years. He won 143 games and six championships, one of Western New York's great high school football coaches. It's Len Jankowitz. He's the first ever Buffalo-born player drafted in the NHL, icing the way for hundreds of future skating stars. Let's light the lamp for Peter Skamora. Please welcome the past president of the Greater Buffalo Sports Hall of Fame, Therese Fortin Barnes. She was a bulldog in four sports at Hamburg High School, bombed in plenty of goals at Ithaca College, and now keeps the law and order on the turf. It's field hockey player, coach, and official Barb Wachowiak. Salamanca star in almost every sport. He hooped it up at Penn State and picked it off in the NFL. Please welcome Chuck Christ. He's the master of memories for America's favorite sport, a Hall of Fame historian, now a Hall of Fame inductee. Welcome former Pro Football Hall of Fame Executive Director, Joe Horrigan. The 
seven outstanding men and women, plus Olympic skier Travis Mayer and our five posthumous honorees make up the 2019 class of inductees into the Greater Buffalo Sports Hall of Fame. And now let's get going to begin honoring our inductees. Our first honoree in the class of 2019 are James and Will White. James and Will White, two emerging baseball stars in the sport's early days, were born in Caton, New York, just a few miles from the Pennsylvania border. In 1870, just the second year of professional baseball, James Deacon White began his playing career. He was known as one of the best defensive catchers in the barehanded era of the game and played for Cleveland, Boston, Chicago, and Cincinnati. He caught more games than any other player during the 1870s, and from 1873 to 1877, he was on five championship teams, three in the National Association and two in the National League, which was formed as the first fully recognized major league in 1876. White brought his talents to the Queen City when he signed with the National League Buffalo Bisons in 1881 and as a 33-year-old first baseman. As a member of the Buffalo Bisons from 1881 to 1885, he was one of Buffalo's big four with Dan Brothers, Hardy Richardson, and Jack Rowe. In 463 games with the Bisons, he hit 301 in 1,994 plate appearances. James Deacon White was inducted into the Baseball Hall of Fame in 2013, voted in by the Veterans Committee. Deacon White's younger brother, Will, was also a star in the early days of professional baseball. Although he was the first Major League Baseball player to wear eyeglasses, people could clearly see it was his pitching stamina and ability that set him apart from his peers. In 1878 with the Cincinnati Reds, he pitched 52 games, all complete games, and finished the season with 30 wins and an ERA of 1.79. The following season, he completed all 75 games he started, pitching 680 innings. That season, he finished with 43 wins and 31 losses with a 1.99 ERA. His starts, complete games, and innings pitched are still Major League records. For the 1882 American Association Cincinnati Red Stockings, he was the league's best pitcher, winning 40 games, losing 23, with an ERA of 1.54. He led the league in wins, complete games, shutouts, and innings pitched. Defensively, he also set a major league record for pitchers with 223 assists. Like his brother, he also joined the Buffalo Bisons of the Players League in 1890. He remained in Buffalo after retirement and founded, partnering with his brother James, Buffalo Optical Company, which is still in operation today. He was also the founder and chief benefactor of the Christ Mission in Buffalo, providing food and shelter to the poor. Will and James Deacon White, forever enshrined in the Greater Buffalo Sports Hall of Fame. Sponsoring the induction of the White Brothers is Buffalo Optical, represented by Dr. Jillian Beyer of the Dr. Beyer Buffalo Optical. She is accepting on behalf of the White Brothers. That's a pretty incredible and amazing story to think that the company that they founded is still going strong here in Western New York. That's pretty cool stuff. Our next Hall of Fame inductee in the class of 2019 is Peggy Waddles. Born in Buffalo in 1911, Peggy Waddles won her first golf tournament as an 11-year-old, paired with her father Frank, the founder of Niagara Frontier Food Tournament. She earned a Western New York District Championship when she took defending champion Mrs. Joseph Bedolik to a second elimination round. Waddles, coached by famed U.S. Open winner Alex Smith, brought her game to unprecedented heights for her age. In 1926, Waddles played her first major tournament, the North and South, in Pinehurst, North Carolina. 
as the 16 and 17 year old she had already secured her way into the local golf record books by winning back-to-back -back western new york golf association championships at wanaka country club a graduate of Bennett Junior College in Millbrook, New York, Waddles proceeded to win six Western New York titles from 1926 through 1932, missing only the 1930 tournament to be a bridesmaid. Upon the invitation of national golf champion Glenna Collette in 1930, Waddles played in the British Women's Championship, the first Buffalonian ever to do so. Then in 1931, after winning two other Florida championships, she headed to Miami, where she won Miami's golf championship. In 1932, Waddles became the first Buffalonian to win the New York State Golf Championship and was the first to gain permanent possession of the Buffalo Evening News Trophy by winning the Women's Buffalo District Golf Association title in 1935, 36, and 37. In 1936, she was the runner-up in the British Colonial Women's Tourney held in Nassau. Waddles added to her international titles by winning two separate tournaments in Bermuda in 1938. Waddles married Robert Pauline in 1939 and settled in New Jersey. She became a founding member of The Magic Shop, a gift shop established to assist returning World War II veterans. Since then, it has been a financial supporter of the Bonnie Bray Home for Boys, a boarding institution that teaches troubled children academic subjects and trade skills. Her benevolent work did not stop there. After discovering inadequate care for an autistic grandson, she, along with her daughter, opened the Princeton Child Developmental Institute in 1970, which grew into one of the nation's outstanding institutions serving those with autism. In 1983, Ronald Reagan honored it as one of the 60 exemplary private schools in the country. Upon Peggy's death in 1996, her daughter remarked that Peggy never compromised and she never denied any possibility of success and she never admitted any possibility of defeat. Peggy Waddles Pauline, forever enshrined in the Greater Buffalo Sports Hall of Fame. Accepting on behalf of Peggy is her daughter, Pam Mackle. Oh, we're off to a good start. We are off and rolling here on the 2019 Hall of Fame induction ceremony. So let's get on to our next honoree. The next inductee in the class of 2019 is Adam Beatty Gunn. Acclaimed in 1902 as America's greatest athlete, Adam Gunn was born in the Highlands of Scotland in 1872, came to the United States at the age of 21, and adopted Buffalo as his hometown. Gunn became a U.S. citizen in 1899. Buffalo's best-known athlete of his generation, Gunn made friends with his high ideals of sportsmanship as well as athletic ability. At a top weight of 158 pounds, he could run, jump, toss weights, box, swim, and wrestle. He twice won the all-rounder championship, the forerunner of today's decathlon. Gunn took first place in the Amateur Athletic Union's U.S. All-Around 1901 Championship at the Pan American Exposition and again won the 1902 championship held at Celtic Park in New York City. At the Pan Am Games, his competitors, many of them 40 pounds heavier than Gunn, were astonished when he put the shot over 42 feet. An all-round athlete, Gunn demonstrated that he was the premier amateur man of muscle in the country. Representing the YMCA Athletic Association of Buffalo, Gunn won the all-around championship of the American Athletes Union at a competition held by the Greater New York Irish Athlete Association at Celtic Park on Long Island. Gunn beat his two opponents in a decisive manner, marking the second time he scored national all-round championship honors. At 30 years old, when most high jumpers had finished competing, Gunn would watch competitive jumpers, plan out a campaign for himself, and continue to participate. In 1905, in a Boston competition, he cleared the crossbar at 5 feet 6 inches. Gunn was employed by the Buffalo General Electric Company and continued to compete in athletic events well into his 40s. After his competing days, Gunn became one of the best-known officials in athletic events of all kinds in western New York. Gunn passed away on his way to Scotland to celebrate his mother's 88th birthday. One obituary about Gunn said, we have known few better men, no better sportsmen. Adam Beatty Gunn, forever enshrined 
in the Greater Buffalo Sports Hall of Fame. Man of Muscle is a top five all-time nickname. That is pretty cool. Accepting on behalf of Adam Gunn are Nick Bond and John Erbar with the YMCA of Buffalo, Niagara. Uh, it is pretty cool to see and realize what an incredible sports history we have here in Western New York that goes back a long way and sort of makes everyone understand why sports are so important to all of us here today. It's the groundwork that those folks have laid up until this point. Our next Hall of Fame inductee in the class of 2019 is Travis Mayer. Travis Mayer was born in Springville, February 22, 1982. He began skiing when he was five years old at Holiday Valley Ski Resort in Ellicottville. It was at Holiday Valley where he first learned to navigate the bumpy terrain popularly called moguls. While skiing at Holiday Valley, he became a member of the resort's freestyle team, which competed throughout the Northeast. In his freshman year at Orchard Park High School, Travis journeyed to Killington Mountain School in Vermont for five months to concentrate on honing his craft. Then he was on the move again, this time to Steamboat Springs, Colorado, to attend high school at the Lowell Whiteman School. In the fall of his junior year, at 16 years old, Travis became a member of the U.S. Ski Team. After high school, he enrolled at Cornell University for the fall semester in 2000. He was looking to explore other life avenues while also seeking to give his body a respite from the multiple years of rigorous training. But the time off did not last long. He requested a leave of absence from school after only one semester. Renewed and reinvigorated from his brief time away from the sport, he returned to skiing full-time at 19 years old as a member of the U.S. Olympic team. His sights were clearly set on Salt Lake City and the 2002 Winter Olympics. Not considered a favorite to win a medal in the games at Salt Lake, Travis nailed his first run and validated that feat with another outstanding performance. A silver medal awaited him at the podium. Travis continued his career by winning his first World Cup event in 2005 at Lake Placid's Whiteface Mountain, while also placing second at his first World Championship later that season in Germany. He was also a member of the U.S. ski team at the 2006 Olympic Games in Turin, Italy, finishing in seventh place. Determined to lead the sport with his body in reasonably good condition, Travis retired from competitive ski. He went on to earn a bachelor's degree in economics from Cornell and a master's degree in business administration from Harvard Business School. Travis Mayer, forever enshrined in the Greater Buffalo Sports Hall of Fame. Travis Mayer could not attend this evening's dinner and we accept the award on his behalf. Our next inductee into the class of 2019 is Jeff Prescott. With multiple New York State and national championships to his credit, Jeff Prescott enters the Greater Buffalo Sports Hall of Fame as one of the organization's most highly decorated wrestlers. Born in Olean in 1969, Prescott was a four-time Section 6 champion at 91, 98, 105, and 112 pounds, and a three-time New York State wrestling champion. Jeff won his titles in consecutive seasons from 1985 through 1987 while prepping at Olean High School. He is one of only 26 New York State wrestlers to win three titles, while only nine have won four and three have triumphed in five. His 120 consecutive wins rank him first in Western New York and sixth in state history. Also, during his high school years, Jeff was a 1987 junior national champion, a USA High School All-American, and named the most outstanding wrestler for the 1986 state tournament. Prescott parlayed his success at Olean into a great career at Penn State. The Nittany Lion was a two-time NCAA Division I champion at 118 pounds in 1990 and 1991, becoming only the second Penn State wrestler to achieve that recognition. 
His 51 dual meet wins rank 17th in school history, and he shares the single season school record for dual wins at 22 from 1991 through 1992. A three-time NCAA Division I All-American, Prescott became the first Penn State wrestler to ever be named the NCAA Tournament's Most Outstanding Wrestler, achieving that honor in 1991. He also lettered all four years during his stay in State College and was team captain as both a junior and a senior. In addition to his collegiate awards, Jeff was the university freestyle champion at 125.5 in 1990 and a member of the 2002 Pan Am team, where he collected a silver medal. He also participated in the National Wrestling Coaches Association European Tour in 1990 and was inducted into the Eastern Wrestling League Hall of Fame in 2007. Jeff Prescott, forever enshrined in the Greater Buffalo Sports Hall of Fame. Sponsoring the induction of Jeff Prescott is Ilio DiPaolo's Restaurant, represented by Dennis DiPaolo, and joined by Jeff's college coach Fitz and Jeff's high school coach Myers. Gentlemen? You got a stool? <laughs> I thought, I thought it was, it was funny, funny, too. Well, that's a nice ring. Thank you very much. Uh, you know, I spent a long time since I've been in front of a lot of people and, and talking and, and uh, giving a speech and, and whatnot. And if there's a lot of thanks going on here tonight. I wouldn't be here without the people that, that helped make me. Um, one of them over there, if you could, Paulette Prescott. Superwoman, superwoman. When I say that, she could eat kryptonite, that lady. She raised three boys that were absolutely crazy kids, and, and how she managed to do that is beyond me. Great woman. Just, mom, I love you. You're, you're, there's no one like you. Thank you for being my mom. I was raised by a Marine, and that should say enough. Um, that guy was just absolutely a nuts, sick, crazy American that his blood runs through my veins, and I thank him. I wish he was here today to see this and, and uh, take all the sin. He's a, an unbelievable man, and uh, Dad, thank you for doing what you did, and you too, Mom. Thank you. There's a lot of uh, coaches, you know, a lot of athletes, they, they go through a lot of coaches. They see a lot of coaches through a lifetime, as I did. I, I've seen hundreds, maybe close to thousands of, of coaches through my lifetime. And uh, tonight, two of them stand up here with me. My high school coach, Jim Myers, uh, right here, guy in the center. My assistant coach, John Fritz, who's a national champion at Penn State in 1975. Coach John Fritz. Uh, I got to tell you a little story about Coach Myers real quick because this is how I got started in wrestling and I, this is how I remember it when I was a kid. I came home from gym class. Coach Myers now was the coach in the Olean High School. He was the high school wrestling coach. But he also was the gym teacher at the elementary school, which makes great recruiting and scouting. So I come home from school one day. My dad says to me, he says, what's wrong, Jeff? I said, well, nothing, nothing's wrong. He's no, he says, what's wrong? Tell me what's wrong. I looked at him, I said, well, people or guys are picking on me in, in gym class because I think I, I'm smaller than them. And this is what my dad told me, and I live by this. He said, son, if somebody picks a fight with you, you make sure you kick their ass. Make sure you kick it so good that they never come back. A little smile came to my face. Then he says, if you start a fight, when you get home, I'm going to kick your ass. <laughs> so I lived by those words. So the next day in school, my gym teacher, Jim Myers, these guys start doing their thing, and I just remember just lighting them up. Well, Coach Myers sends me home with a flyer. I ask him, I said, what's this? What's this, Mr. Myers? He says, don't worry about it. Just go home and give it to your dad. 
So I get home and I give this to my father and he's like, uh, what's this? I said, I don't know. He looked at it, I said, uh, what is it? He says, Jeff, you wanna, you wanna do this? I said, I don't know, what is it? He said, it's wrestling. It's kind of like fighting without punching somebody. So I said, yeah, let's, let's try that. And uh, it was on from there and great recruiting for uh, Coach Myers and three state titles for, for Olean, which I thought was pretty awesome. So that's how it all started. Then we go on to uh, bigger and better things and, you know, wrestling around the world, wrestling for Foxcatcher, for John DuPont, you know, wrestling at Penn State was the most amazing thing that I think I've ever done. The people at Penn State, my coaches that I had there are just phenomenal. Uh, the people that you meet at that school is, is unbelievable and I think you can uh, attest to that, Mr. Christ. With a little smile. Anyways, I want to say thank you. I have, I have a lot of people that came out here to see me tonight. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, all my training partners, the people that have, you know, blood, sweat, and tears with me, and, and the guys that put up with my shit for years over here, these guys. I was kind of the black sheep, to be honest with you. And uh, without these guys guiding me, without my parents helping me, my coaches helping me, and the, and the people around me helping me, it never would have happened. It never would have happened. So really tonight, my, my honor goes to them and this honor is for them. So I wanna say thank you for everybody coming out and, and the committee, the Greater Buffalo Sports Hall of Fame committee, thank you very much. And uh, Epstein didn't kill himself. <laughs> I think I have ever heard wrestling described as fighting without punches, and I can't think of a better way to describe wrestling other than fighting without punches. Good stuff, Jeff. I also have never heard anyone quite so endearingly use the words nuts, sick, and crazy about their father and have everybody in this room know exactly what you meant. So we are off to a rip-roaring start here, and Jeff has set the bar pretty high, but I know the rest of our induction class is going to dazzle us as well, too. Speaking of which, the next opportunity for that is our next inductee. In the class of 2019, his name is Peter Scamora. Born in Buffalo in 1955, Peter Skimmer's original athletic focus was on tennis, at which he was very successful. From age 11 through 17, he was winning state championships in singles and doubles alongside his brother David. The duo at one point was ranked fourth in the East for doubles, and Peter was ranked in the top 20 in the region for several years in singles. Skimmer's hockey career started when he was 10 years old on the outdoor rinks in the house leagues of Tonawanda. After House, he played for Nichols High School as a freshman and sophomore before transferring to Amherst High School to finish up his prep years. During his senior season, Peter played for the Niagara Falls Flyers in the Tier 2 Junior A League and was named a first-team All-Star. His talents were noticed by Wisconsin coach Bob Johnson, and he was recruited to play for the Badgers. Skimmer's time at Wisconsin was short as he left after his first season to play for Roger Nielsen in Peterborough. During the 1973-74 season, the Peets were chosen to represent Canada in the World Junior Championships as the top-ranked team in the Canadian Hockey League. In Peter's second year with the team, he scored 62 points and was runner-up for the Defenseman of the Year Award. In the 1975 NHL Draft, Peter Skimura was drafted 19th overall by the Washington Capitals, becoming the first player ever drafted from Buffalo. That same year, he was also picked 50th overall by the Cleveland Crusaders of the WHA. He was the highest drafted player from Western New York until Patrick Kane was selected first overall in 2007. 
Over four injury-plagued seasons with the Capitals, Skamura played 132 games and tallied eight goals with 25 assists. He also spent time in the AHL, playing 43 games with three franchises. After multiple knee surgeries, Peter went across the Atlantic to play one final season with Sepa of the Finnish Elite League. His life after professional hockey involved training standard red horses. He called Maryland home during his time while traveling the East Coast training horses. Peter and his wife Rebecca decided to return to Buffalo to raise their four children. Back in Buffalo, Peter worked for the family financial planning business, Maximum Equities, as a certified financial planner. In 2018, Peter and his brother David were inducted into the Buffalo Tennis Hall of Fame. And tonight, Peter Skimura is forever enshrined in the Greater Buffalo Sports Hall of Fame. Sponsoring Peter's induction is the Nichols School, represented today by Peter's sister, Donna Fabry. Peter? Thank you, sir. Evening, everybody. Very, very proud to be here tonight and honored. Moments like this are definitely a time for reflection. I've had about seven months now to, to think about things. When I look back at my childhood growing up in Buffalo, I recall my family's passion for sports, especially tennis. Tennis was a sport we all played. We competed in playing tournaments up and down the East Coast, New York State, and all over, of course, locally. My dad used to keep a pad and pencil, I remember, right by our kitchen table. And right around dessert time, that pad and pencil would come out, and we'd start going over different strategies for tennis. And this is when we were very, very young, so you can imagine just uh, you know, how serious we were about our tennis. It was a main focal point for sure. Eventually, my brother David and I attained a high enough ranking nationally, and we were able to be invited to the elite junior tournaments all around the country. We traveled to Louisville, Kentucky for the Western Open. We went to Chattanooga, Tennessee, Kalamazoo, Michigan, for the national tournaments. All the top juniors were at these events. Players like Jimmy Connors, Johnny McEnroe, Vitas Gerulaitis, and on and on. Because we were playing three or four sports at the time, it was a little difficult to compete at this elite level, high level of tennis, but we both enjoyed the challenge. I must admit, we were first not a hockey family at all. Recently, it's funny, because I, I just had the TV on and I was watching uh, the NHL Network and they had some uh, young Canadian NHL players and they were interviewing them about how they got started and so forth. And the story was essentially the same. They started skating around three uh, their mother and father had played, as well as their siblings and most of their cousins. Uh, this was very different from my upbringing in Buffalo back in the 60s, where neither of my parents played, nor any of my siblings uh, ever played hockey. There was not even a pair of skates in our house. Our winners were spent bowling, playing squash, and basketball. This would all change, though, in about 1965, my parents enrolled me in Nichols School. I was in fifth grade, and I was actually signing up for basketball for the, my winter sport when a teacher informed me that basketball was full and would I mind trying playing hockey? I said, I guess. You know, I didn't know anything about it. I said, I'll try. So my hockey career, career uh, actually began by accident, and unfortunately, I knew nothing about the sport. I didn't know how to skate, I didn't know how to put on my equipment, and I didn't know how to hold a stick properly. I didn't know if I was a lefty or a righty or whatever. So nevertheless, in 1965, I went out for my first tryout for a house league team in the town of Tonawanda. 
Uh, after running us through some drills on the Brighton outdoor rink, most of the rinks were outdoors back then, uh, the coaches lined about 30 of us up on the uh, goal line after the tryout. And they came by one by one and touched the players they wanted on their team on the shoulder. Well, it wasn't long before I was the only one on the goal line. So <laughs> I was the last player picked, and I, I must admit that uh, it seemed like an eternity, but I was on that goal line, I was terrified until finally Mr. Fix, coach of the Panthers, approached me and handed me my first official hockey jersey. Mr. Fix was a kind and generous man, and he had me over all winter at, the, at his rink on St. John Street, right near St. Joe's, and I skated there all winter uh, every weekend. Hockey wasn't as structured back then in the 60s as it is now. There was no USA hockey as far as I know, no development camps or clinics to teach the finer points of the game to the younger players. I did most of my skating in house leagues or at pickup games in someone's backyard rink. Nevertheless, my hockey skills evolved fairly quickly and in just nine short years, I was being drafted 19th overall by the Washington Capitals. I was fortunate enough to make the team my rookie year. I can still remember my excitement and how emotional I was as I waited in line at the Cap Center to go on the ice to play my first NHL game against the Pittsburgh Penguins. As a member of the NHL, I would soon be competing against the best players in the world, of which maybe five or six percent were Americans. It was not long before I was elevated to the top defensive pair with my partner Rick Green. Our responsibility was to play against the opposing team's best forwards, best opposing lines. We found ourselves defending the likes of Marcel Dion, Charlie Simmer, Dave Taylor out in L.A., Brian Trottier, Char uh, Clark Gillies, excuse me, and Mike Bossy in, in Long Island, Bobby Clark, Bill Barber, and Reg Reggie Leach in Philly, and of course our very own French Connection. I also had the privilege of playing against my childhood idols and hockey legends Bobby Orr and Gordy Howe. All in all, it was quite a journey. I am often asked if I ever regret sacrificing so much of my time to pursue all of my athletic goals. I always answer this question the same way. I never considered what I went through as a sacrifice. I thoroughly enjoyed all the experiences and challenges I encountered along the way. The major sacrifices, of course, came from my parents. They were my role models, my teachers, and my support team. They drilled into me at a very early age the importance of having a strong work ethic, a strong sense of accountability, and a strong and powerful will to compete. Besides all their guidance and support, they sacrificed the most precious commodity any up of us up here possess, they sacrificed their time. They're the main reason I'm on this stage tonight in front of you. I would like to thank the Buffalo Hall of Fame Committee for this great honor I'm receiving tonight, as well as for organizing this, this wonderful event that I've been able to share with my family and friends, many of whom have traveled a long, long way to be here tonight. I would also like to take the time to congratulate my fellow inductees of the class of 2019 for all their tremendous accomplishments. Thank you all very much. Have a great evening. Peter, I hope you have gone back and thanked all of those members of the Nichols School fifth grade basketball team for filling those slots up so you could become a hockey star.
Although I would guess that had those spots not been filled, he might be here as a basketball legend just as well. Well, speaking of basketball, we do have a Basketball Hall of Famer to tell you about next. She is our next inductee in the class of 2019, and her name is Dorothy Jones. Dorothy Jones, born and raised in Buffalo, attended McKinley High School, where she played basketball for four years before attending the University of Louisville. At McKinley, she was selected first team all high and all New York State as a senior in 1984. She scored more than 1,100 points in her McKinley career and was later inducted in 2010 to the McKinley Sports Hall of Fame. At Louisville, the point guard averaged 10.2 points and nearly four assists during the 1987-88 season. In 1986-87, she averaged nine points and four assists. She finished her career with 804 points and 399 assists in 114 games. She led the team in assists for three seasons and still ranks 10th in Louisville women's basketball history in assists. In 1987-88, she was team captain and later voted Louisville's best all-around athlete. Jones continued her love of basketball by becoming an official for high school and women's college basketball for nearly 20 years. She officiated at the NCAA Division I level for 10 years and now concentrates on Division II, III, and junior college games. She reached the pinnacle of her profession in 2012 when she had the opportunity to officiate the NCAA Division III Final Four at Hope College in Holland, Michigan. She has also refereed the New York State Public High School State Tournament twice. She recently retired from the New York State Police after a 25-year career, and in 2019, Dorothy Jones is forever enshrined in the Greater Buffalo Sports Hall of Fame. Sponsoring the induction of Dorothy Jones is the University of Louisville, represented by Jeff Walls, the head coach of the Cardinals, and Sue Green, longtime officiating friend. We say, Mama, we made it. Mama, we made it. All right. Uh, I'd first like to thank, uh, we got a national coach of the year here from the University of Louisville, who, he, 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 wa he wasn't my coach, and I'm 31 years out, but he put Louisville on the map, a well, Final Four team, championship team, uh, Elite Eight, Sweet 16. It is an absolute honor beyond measure to have Coach Walls here for me tonight. Thank you so much. <laughs> to my uh, dear friend Sue Green, uh, we started off as sisters in officiating, and now we are sisters in life. Uh, we talk about having go-to people in life. First call in the morning, last call at night. Uh, first call on the way to a game, first call after a game. This is my Sue Green. Thank you so much for being here for me. Thank you. I'd like to thank uh, the Greatest Buffalo Sports Hall of Fame and all its committee members for uh, bestowing this amazing, amazing honor upon me. Um, in particular, Brian Kavanaugh and Leo Kaminsky in uh, Bridget Nyland. Thank you so much for thinking of me. Um, to all the inductees who I'm honored to be beside tonight, congratulations to you all. Uh, it's amazing to be able to stand beside such amazing athletes. Uh, it's just overwhelming. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. Um, sometimes, sometimes in life when things happen to you, you have to wonder, uh, am I truly worthy of this? And you think about it, and then I say, if I'm not worthy, I do know that the people who have made me who I am, who have supported me throughout my life, who have push me in every direction in life are worthy of this honor. I'm accepting this on all their behalf. I'm going to start with my folks. Uh, my late father, um, Joseph Jones, 
who, if you want to look at a relationship between a father and a daughter and the love that a father and a daughter had, we had that. And it still lasts today, even though he's been gone for 20 years. Um, I accept this on your behalf, Dad. Um, to my mother, my 83-year-old mother is here tonight. Um, this athletic gene that I have, I got it from her. Uh, the story goes back down in Tennessee. She rode a horse to school. She fought all her cousins' fights, and she was a pretty good athlete in her own right. Uh, she's been my number one fan. She is by far the strongest woman that I have ever met. And I'm happy that she is the leader of our family. Annie Jones, my mother, I love you beyond measure. <laughs> to all my brothers and sisters, all six of them, I'm the youngest, number seven. In particular, my brother Joe, who's here tonight, and my sister-in-law Donna, who are here tonight, and my cousin Keith Sweat, who are here. Thank you for everything that you've done for me, for your support, your protection, your love. I couldn't ask for a better family. Um, my brother Joe's a great athlete in his own right as well. He's in the Harvard Cup Hall of Fame, and uh, I'm happy to call him my big brother. <laughs> to all 50 plus, I have 50 plus nieces and nephews. Um, I, Auntie loves you all. In particular, I have a very strong relationship with two, with two in particular. Uh, my nephew, Joe Jones III, he's a freshman at Georgia State University playing basketball. Um, he's on a full scholarship there. And also, my nephew, Jayon Renfro, is playing football at Hudson Valley Community College. They text Auntie all the time, and Auntie loves them both so much. And I hope they do well in their athletic endeavors. To my, to my state, state police state family. family, I got two of my boys in the house who's, who uh, protected and served the state of New York with me for many years. Uh, Tony Palmer, James Talford, I love you guys. Thank you so much for being here. To my officiating family, Winnie Bowles, table 18 in the house. Thank you guys for being here, for all your support always, in particular Bruce Hoffman. Thank you so much for being such a, a big inspiration to me. Um, to all the schools that shaped me, School 48 when I was a young kid, School 90, which was the sunshine of my life, West Hurdle Middle School, Riverside High School as a freshman, McKinley High School, Coach Zaire Dorsey is here in the building. Uh, we've established a very, very good friendship. Thank you for being here, Coach. Uh, University of Louisville, thank you for coming to Buffalo, and it was a snowstorm when they came to recruit me. Uh, I'd like to say a special thank you to my head coach, Peggy Fear. The late uh, Rene Malloy was my assistant coach, and the coach who signed me as her first recruit, Loretta Hummerdorf, and all my teammates from there, I'd like to say thank you very much. Um, to all my extended family, all my friends, all the people who supported me, mentored me, prayed for me, who trained me, who coached me, all my Empire State game coaches, Sal Biscaglia, Mike Rappel, all my Empire State game teammates, Kathy Sweet, I love you, uh, Cara Hahn, Yvette Angel, thank you all. Um, all the people who wear stripes with me, uh, you have become my new family, thank you so much. I accept this honor on all your behalf. I'm gonna say a special thank you to my Bobby Joe for making my house a home, for making our house a home for the last 18 years. And our daughter, Keena Ray, mother loves you very much. And I'm gonna conclude by saying, if I forgot anybody, I'm so sorry. I thank all of you uh, for all your support throughout the years. I'm gonna say to all of the young ladies from the Girls Sports Foundation and beyond, all the young ladies who, who walk like me, who talk like me, who look like me. I see you all, I see you all, and I hope that you see me and know that anything is truly possible. Thank you so much.
Boy, uh, Dorothy, if your friends from Louisville think this is a snowstorm, you should invite them back uh, in about two months. Let them really see what that is. Our next inductee into the 2019 class of the Greater Buffalo Sports Hall of Fame is Ed Hughes. Ed Bud Hughes was a three-sport standout at Kensington High School in the 1940s and was recognized by the Buffalo Courier Express as its all-high fullback in 1946. Bud also played baseball and was an accomplished middle distance runner on Kensington's track and field champions. Bud's collegiate plans originally included North Carolina State, but financial issues dictated he attend Cameron Junior College in Oklahoma. Hughes would later attend the University of Tulsa, where he played on both sides of the ball, helping the Golden Hurricanes to an 8-1-1 record before falling to Florida 14-13 in the 1953 Gator Bowl. Ed was a 10th round draft choice of the Los Angeles Rams in 1954. As a professional football player, Bud played two seasons with the Rams and three years for the New York Giants as a defensive back. He was part of the 1955 Rams team that reached the NFL championship game, and he played in two title games with the Giants in 1956 and 1958. Hughes parlayed his playing career to a position on the sidelines. After assisting at his alma mater in 1959, he became the Dallas Texans defensive backs coach in 1960. The Texans won the American Football League title in 1962 with Hughes' defensive backcourt picking up five George Blanda passes in the finale. He moved from Dallas to Denver and then Washington before settling in as the 49ers offensive coordinator in 1968. Hughes was named head coach of the Houston Oilers in 1971, but his tenure at the top ended after only one year and a 4-9-1 record. Following that season, the Buffalo native made five different NFL stops from 1972 to 1981, working primarily as an offensive assistant. He received a big break when the Chicago Bears hired him as the team's offensive coordinator in 1982. His seven-year stint in the Windy City included a Super Bowl ring with the 1985 Bears. Hughes concluded his coaching career with the Eagles in 1989. A professional football coach for 30 years, Ed Bud Hughes passed away in June of 2000 at the age of 72. Tonight, he takes his place in the Greater Buffalo Sports Hall of Fame. Hall of Fame. Sponsoring the induction of Ed Hughes are the New York Giants, and representing and presenting the ring are Ed's son, Jim Hughes, and his daughters, Madeline and Maureen Hughes. Our next inductee into the class of 2019 is Chuck Christ. A native of Salamanca, Chuck Chris quickly demonstrated his athletic prowess at Salamanca High School, where he was named the most valuable player on four separate teams during his senior year. In 1967, he quarterbacked the football team and was the Southwest Conference Player of the Year. On the hardwood, Chris was first team All-Western New York and averaged 24.6 points per game, leading the Warriors to the Section 4 championship and finished his career with more than 1,000 points. On the baseball field, Chuck was named first team All-League, and in track and field, his school record for the triple jump, 45 feet, one and a quarter inches, still stands today. Chris was offered football and basketball scholarships to Penn State, but decided to shift his focus to basketball. He lettered for three years at Penn State, leading the Nittany Lions in field goal percentage, 49.3%, and was named the team's most valuable player in his junior year. As the team's captain in his senior season, he led them to a 17-8 record and again was named the team's MVP. Despite his success in college basketball, Chris returned to the gridiron. He walked on with the New York Giants and made the team as a defensive back. He played seven seasons in the NFL with the Giants, New Orleans Saints, and the San Francisco 49ers. In 1977, 
He led the Saints defense and was named the team's defensive MVP. He finished his career with 20 interceptions, including six in 1978 as a member of the 49ers. Following his football career, Chuck Crist moved back to Western New York and began to show his athletic skills at yet another sport, golf. He won the club championship at Holiday Valley six times. Chuck was recognized as the Southwestern New York Athlete of the Century by the Olean Times Herald. He was inducted into the Cattaraugus County Athletic Hall of Fame in 2003, the Chautauqua Sports Hall of Fame in 2015, and tonight is forever enshrined in the Greater Buffalo Sports Hall of Fame. the century. Chuck, you're going to hang on to that title for a while. Presenting Chuck Chris for induction is the Litro Law Firm, represented by Fran Litro and Chuck's childhood friend, Dan Metzler. Uh... Thank you. Unlike another Penn State grad, I need notes because uh, uh, after five concussions my rookie year in the NFL, sometimes I can't remember things. <laughs> Good evening to President uh, Tom Kohler, my host Ron Burdovich, and the entire Hall of Fame committee. Thank you for your selection into this distinguished membership. Congratulations to all the others here tonight. My heartfelt gratitude to longtime friend Francis Litro, his amazing wife Cindy Abbott, and my good friend Dan Metzler, who's here, for their sponsorship and support. I guess the unique path of my athletic adventures caught someone's eye. Athletic success is no such matter of chance is a matter of choice. Hours of hard work and sacrifice, believing in oneself regardless of what other people think or say. I was a small kid who practiced countless hours in my backyard playing imaginary games. The little kid with the big dreams who often was the last one chosen for games or teams. People laughed when I told them someday I wanted to be a pro athlete. Author Grayson Marshall said, and I quote, if people aren't laughing at your dreams, your dreams aren't big enough. The laughter continued to high school when as a sophomore I was only five foot two and weighed 110 pounds. And then it happened. I grew eight inches and gained 50 pounds in seven months drove my mom crazy with trying to get me in clothes. During high school, I shared the Ole End Times Herald Player of the Year and all Western New York basketball team with my good friend, Dan Metzler. League MVP in baseball and still have the Salamanca triple jump record of 45 feet one inch. Received the very prestigious Billy Kelly Award from the Buffalo Courier Express. I was recruited by Division I colleges to play football and or basketball. I chose Va Holiday Valley, Penn State. I was promised a shot to be a quarterback, but Coach Paterno, during a brief meeting regarding my position, explained they had signed 15 recruits at quarterback. He emphatically told me, I'm moving you to defensive back. Shook my head, I looked and I paused, took a deep breath and replied, with all due respect, coach, I'm a basketball player. <laughs> Returning home now at 6'2", 215 pounds, I was captain and MVP both my junior and senior years. Never played a single down of college football. Hall of Fame coach, or Hall of Fame great as well, Yogi Berra once said, when you come to the take in the ford, for, excuse me, the fork in the road, take it. My dream to be a professional athlete still burned inside me and led me to a trial with the New York Giants. 
I can still feel the sense of aura and the chill up my spine as I walk down to the field at iconic Yankee Stadium. They invited me to training camp, a basketball kid who didn't even know his helmet size. By the way, a defensive back. Final cuts came and I was officially a member of the team, the once tiny small town kid with a big crazy dream was now the youngest player in 1972 in the NFL. I had the good fortune to have played seven years in the NFL in three great places, New York, New Orleans, and San Francisco. Teammates in New Orleans voted me MVP in 1977 season. Hank Stram was one of my favorite coaches, and I can remember at one of the meetings when one of my teammates fell asleep, he said, remember, there's no I in team, but there are two I's in idiot. <laughs> Despite the glamour of these big cities, my wife and I always returned to our beloved Western New York in the off season. My wife, Patty, an MVP in the real estate world, was my high school sweetheart. We have shared this incredible journey for 50 years of marriage. Sometimes I love you like the moon, just like Ralph Cramden. With us tonight are both my wonderful children, Scott and Nikki, three of the four grandchildren, Carson, Haley, and Cameron. Cole is in college in North Carolina. They are joined by my four siblings and many in-laws, no outlaws that I know of. I treasure the lifelong friendships and acquaintances made through sports, coaching at all levels, being a school principal and having moved over 30 times in my married life. Bemis Point, Ellicottville, Alford, New York. Tonight is a way to conclude my athletic career. I see as not at the end, but as joining another team, another special team, the Greater Buffalo Sports Hall of Fame team. Thank you all for making my special day part of yours. You know, Chuck, uh, you now have a couple of things in common with Jim Kelly. You're both members of the Greater Buffalo Sports Hall of Fame, and you're both guys that Penn State told couldn't play quarterback. <laughs> inductee into the class of 2019, Len Jankowitz. Len Jankowitz grew up in Lancaster and was a member of the high school football program as a player and coach for over four decades. He lettered in both football and baseball in Lancaster, playing under legendary coach Joe Foyle before graduating in 1969. Len was drafted by the Pittsburgh Pirates as a first baseman, but decided to go on to Brockport State, where he played football and baseball and majored in math education. He returned home to Western New York in 1973 and taught school in Clarence for two years before returning to Lancaster High School as a classroom teacher and assistant football coach from 1974 through 1985 under Coach Foyle. He became head coach in 1986 and posted a record of 143 wins, 93 losses, and two ties during his 26-year career while leading the Redskins to six league titles and nine appearances in the Section 6 championship game. Len took over as Lancaster's athletic director in 1993 and supervised an extensive renovation of the school's athletic facilities, including the construction of a 31,000 square foot multi-purpose field house over the next 18 years. He added eight teams to the school's already large offering of interscholastic athletic programs. 
In honor of his exemplary service as AD, the school named the upgraded facilities the Jankowitz Athletic Complex in 2012. After more than 40 years with Lancaster High School, he retired in 2012. After retirement, he helped establish the Western New York Amateur Football Alliance, an organization that promotes amateur football at the youth, high school, and local college level. He initiated the Western New York Junior Football Combine for high school football, as well as a college night where graduating high school football players and their parents have a chance to meet college coaches from the tri-state area. He is a charter member and officer in the Western New York High School Football Coaches Association and received the John D. Burns Award for continuous dedication, loyalty, commitment, longevity, contributions, and service to high school football. Tonight, Coach Len Jankowicz joins the Greater Buffalo Sports Hall of Fame. Sponsoring the induction of Len Jankowicz are the Empire State Games, represented by Leo Kaminsky and Jay Josker, board members of the Empire Games. So I gotta follow the athlete of the century. That's not too bad. Little guy from Lancaster, Peter. What's this all about here? I don't know. Okay, for the people out of town, welcome to Buffalo. The home of the Buffalo Bills. Let's hear it. The Buffalo Sabres, right? The Buffalo Bandits. The Buffalo Bisons. And last but not least, the Buffalo Meat Raffles. Now, how many of you here, how many have never been to a meat raffle in Buffalo? And you're all liars if you raise your hand. I can't thank the Greater Buffalo Sports Hall of Fame enough for this classy manner that they conduct themselves and the way they've treated myself and my wife and everybody from my family. I extend my hearty congratulations to everybody on this dais here. What an outstanding group of people. We've applauded them numerous times and continue to do so in our hearts for what they've contributed to Western New York. And to share the stage with all of you is really my ultimate honor. And by the way, the careers that you've had impacted so many. And from my experience, you never realize how many they really impacted if you think about it. Now, my liaison for the Greater Buffalo Sports Hall of Fame was Mr. Kevin Lester. No cackles from the audience yet. All right, well, he's a heck of a person, by the way. He's a former AD at Will South. And by the way, if they changed the name Williamsville to Lesterville, not many people would grumble. The guy is famous in that town. But I got to tell you something, Kevin had a conversation with me a little while ago, and he's, he said, hey, Len, I'm going to send you a sample thank you letter, just so that you don't screw up a little bit in terms of what's been done. Oh, all right, Kevin, okay. So he, said, he sends me this thank you letter, folks, and he said, maybe you'll get some ideas. Well, it's from Phil McConkie, okay, New York Giant, New York Giant, Super Bowl 41 champ. Sign is a 27-year-old Navy midshipman, Canisius grad. He's got a prodigious, prodigious career in the NFL. Great. All right, so I get this letter from Kevin. Now, I didn't tell Kevin this. I already completed my thank you letter, okay? And I was ready to send it back to him, but I read the fame McConkie letter, and I almost had a heart attack. I counted 27 names on Phil's thank you letter. Now... I had 176 names on my thank you letter after I got rid of 54. So what was I going to do? Well, let me tell you this. So all of you, if you don't see your name on the thank you letter, it's Kevin Lester, Greater Buffalo Sports Hall of Fame email, and if you want a cell number, let me know. Okay, you can complain to him. Sorry, Kevin. Now, there are some 343 inductees presently in the Greater Buffalo Sports Hall of Fame. Unequivocally, 
Folks, I'll tell you, none, none have been influenced by a greater number of leaders, educators, coaches, family, community support members more than myself. And I'd like to present my case tonight and prove my point. Now, first and foremost, I'd like to recognize my parents who put a strong emphasis on education, hard work, and an unshakable faith in God as the real tenets of success. And I extend my heartfelt gratitude to my dear wife, Robin, with all my family present today. Thank you, folks. They're my foundation where everything has started. Thank you for being here. Now, the Lancaster contingent, okay? Now, these are my administrators, my wonderful office secretary, Mrs. Sue Ahrens, the fellow coaches, friends, teammates from my high school days, and all those community supporters that are here from the bottom of my heart, thank you. And as an athletic director, your parents, you probably agree with this, sometimes letters come to your desk and you have to handle phone calls or they're not the nicest to handle. But my administrators above me in my district knew that education came in many more places in their schools than just a classroom. But above all, and a lot of them are here tonight, they taught me this. They taught me how to listen. They taught me not just the words of complaints are important, but, but to understand the motivation why it was placed in the first place. In other words, they taught me the meaning of empathy. And they took a risk on me. And if you ask Dr. Joe Girardi, my superintendent, they took a hell of a risk on me. Or in fact, don't ask him. He might tell you another story, too. The coaches I've been around inspired student athletes in so many different ways. It really inspired me. A lot of them are here today. They were outstanding coaches who focused on positive connections with student athletes. But here's the deal. They demanded real commitment. Greater Buffalo Sports Hall of Fame 2007 inductee coach Joe Foyle, a person of character who, by the way, he comes around as often as Haley's Comet, okay, still to this day hasn't lost his edge in terms of impacting his wisdom on young coaching talent in Lancaster. And a couple of my coaching adversaries, Coach Wally Huckno of Jamestown, a Greater Buffalo Sports Hall of Fame, I believe 2005 inductee, and Coach Bob Kazer of Lockport humbled me so many times, I forget. However, they were class men, emblematic of character, and today remain some of my dearest friends. And those high school athletes, folks, they were our lifeblood. The excitement of competition and seeing young people learn valuable lessons for a lifetime, is there any better way to spend a career? And my dear friends of Section 6 Athletics, I'm still part of that now, and the Western New York Amateur Football Alliance, the people who spend their lives toward the betterment of youth motivated me by way of their sacrifices to do more for them. And finally, <laughs> the College of Brockport Roots, my brotherhood of teammates and people who are now and who have been impactful leaders in their own careers. From the present head football coach at Brockport, Lancaster alumnus Jason Mangoni, to my college teammates of the late 60s and early 70s, led by our alumni leader, I know he's here today, Frank Connell, all of you continue to be so special to me. So what am I most thankful for when my first name changed to uh, coach? I thought about all the great relationships that were made along the way, the big wins, the big losses, the impact coaches had on developing the fragile mindsets of young student athletes. I could go on and on. But what impacted me the most? I'd like to end with a story. So it begins 
with a lady who was a good athlete, even to this day, but she never competed on a high school athletic team. I witnessed firsthand her faithfulness to consummate care of a loved one. Every day for two years, I witnessed true dedication to selfless care for an elderly parent. She dealt with dementia, mobility issues, rude behavior, and other, some of you know, not so nice age-related changes. But here's my point, and everybody can agree with this, I think. I personally saw the real-life enactment of this, perseverance, the ability to manage stress, the stress of losing, the stress of injury, the stress of not knowing what's ahead, resiliency, commitment, determination, and discipline. 365 days a year, 24-7, this lady never wavered. And if there was a situation where she needed help, her sister was right there and her brother were right there, the tender care was fueled by love. Now, who here today, coach or athlete, hasn't been significantly impacted by those traits I just mentioned because of the involvement of a particular sport? And you can toss in sacrifice, you can toss in hard work, you can toss in leadership, and that there are no guarantees, no matter how much you work or how hard you work, a successful career. You never know, even though you think you deserve it. You know why? It's all part of the human experience. Ladies and gentlemen, in your heart you can nod because sport mirrors life. Out of everything in my career, I'm most thankful for those valuable life traits we gain from coaching or participating in sport. And I'm sure I share that with my Lancaster and Brockport brethren. And by the way, that lady who was a good athlete in my story, who showed me by example what's important in life, that lady who attained fulfillment in life because of her amazing, unrelenting ability to serve those who serve others, that was my wife, Robin. caring for our dad and giving him the greatest example to live by. Now, out of everything in my life, I'm most thankful for her. I love you too, dear. And finally, as presented, I think I made a case that this award I'm getting here is more about you than it is about me. I just thank God for the blessings all of you have given me and who are present here tonight. Thank you. Len, uh, now that you're in, we're putting you in charge of the first ever Greater Buffalo Sports Hall of Fame meat raffle. So get working on that, will you? Our next inductee into the class of 2019, Barb Wachowiak. Barb Wachowiak graduated from Hamburg High School, where she was a four-sport athlete in field hockey, volleyball, basketball, and softball. She earned first team Western New York ECIC in field hockey in 1980 and was later inducted into the Hamburg High Wall of Fame. She then attended Ithaca College where she led the Bombers field hockey program to national prominence. In 1982, her penalty stroke goal was the clinching score as the Bombers claimed the NCAA Division III championship. In 1984, she helped Ithaca upset top-ranked Portland with an overtime goal in the NCAA Division III playoffs. 
She led Ithaca to regional titles in 1982, 83, and 84 when she was voted the most valuable offensive player and was named first team all New York State with 11 goals and six assists. She finished her Ithaca career eighth in scoring, ninth in goals, and 10th in assists. She also played right field for the Ithaca softball team. She was captain in 1985, offensive MVP that year, and earned all East recognition. Wachowiak competed on 18 Empire State Games Western Region field hockey teams and won two gold, three silver, and three bronze medals. She also competed internationally, playing in the 2016 FIH Masters World Cup in Canberra, Australia. She earned a spot on the over 45 team despite being eligible for the over 50 team and won a bronze medal by defeating South Africa in overtime shootouts. Wachowiak became assistant field hockey coach at Central Michigan before returning home to coach softball, basketball, and track at Hamburg High. Now a phys ed teacher in the Buffalo Public Schools, she coaches bowling and tennis at Hutch Tech. Her bowling teams have placed first or second each year, while tennis has placed first, second, or third each season. Barb has been one of the best field hockey officials in the country for 26 years and currently serves as a level three field hockey umpire and a level two futures coach. She officiated the NCAA Division III Final Four from 1987 to 2014 and 2017. Barb developed the Gotta Play Field Hockey Camp 11 years ago and has seen many of those participants play field hockey at all three NCAA levels. Barb Wachowiak, forever enshrined in the Greater Buffalo Sports Hall of Fame. Sponsoring the induction is the Hamburg Alumni Foundation, represented by board member Patricia Carr. I can teach a group of 50 kids how to play field hockey. I can officiate the NCAA finals. I can play internationally with and against Olympians. None of this makes me nervous. Giving this speech makes me extremely nervous. <laughs> All you inductees, you've done a great job, and I, I, you stole some of my thunder thanking everybody, but it'll work. So tonight, because I do get nervous doing these kind of things, I thought I would pretend that you were all field hockey coaches and I was giving a rules interpretation. But I knew that wasn't gonna work because I'm in a field hockey official and half of you would like what I say and half of you wouldn't. So tonight, I'm gonna make you all honorary field hockey players. I'm gonna wave my magic wand so that I can get through this. So welcome to the greatest sports family there is. Thank you, Greater Buffalo Sports Hall of Fame, for the induction. It's an amazing honor. And also thank you, Hamburg Alumni Foundation, for sponsoring me tonight. I appreciate it. It's amazing how small this world really is. Two of my Hamburg High School classmates were involved in my induction. Tricia Wichter Carr, who's been my classmate in high school for four years because it was all alphabetical, is a board member of the Hamburg Alumni Foundation and thank you again for sponsoring me. She presented me with the ring tonight and I'm just totally overwhelmed by that. Her husband, Ron Carr, is a board member for the Hall of Fame and he was my host. But I do wanna get one thing straight, Ron, because I know this is really gonna bug you. He tells everybody that he hit grand slams off of me when I pitched in Little League. He is totally mistaken. It's much more like, Ron, I struck you out numerous times, so please get this story straight. <laughs> Growing up, I used to love to play outside, and it didn't matter what sport it was. We played a lot of street hockey, and we also played, we called street hockey in the driveways as well. We, we invented a game, I don't know if that's totally true, but we called it 50 goals. Your first four goals that you scored were worth 10 points each, and then after that, it was one point each. My brothers and I pretended we were the French Connection. I was Rick Martin. My brothers were the other two famous guys on the line. I used to win that game a lot because I just loved to score. I loved to snipe. It was one of my favorite things to do when I played. But scoring meant you had to go to defense, 
And I really didn't enjoy defense so much. So when I did go to defense, Rick Martin, sorry, I decided to play like Jim Schoenfeld. And boy, did that pay off in my hockey career. I used a move called the Wayne Cashman. People familiar with that? The Wayne Cashman getting checked through the Zamboni? Yeah. So I would legally check somebody into the garage doors when I could, because it was the best thing going. And I'd say, that's Jim Schoenfeld's move, so it's legal. I will bet you in a million years the French Connection never thought a field hockey, would, a field hockey player would thank, her, thank them for her success. But French Connection, thank you very much. When I was training for the World Cup at Hutch Tech before school started, before the school day started, I would train in the hallway, hallways, and my colleagues were the best people on earth, and they're here tonight, and thank you for coming. They would cheer me on, they would wave American flags, and they would hold up inspirational posters. The JROTC kids would give me thumbs up or little waves when they were in school at 6.45 in the morning for class. My students were the absolute best. During the day when I had them in class, they'd come down to me and say, Coach, I saw you training today. And uh, dumb me, I would say, so how'd I do? Was I training all right? They go, no, you were dogging it. You better pick it up if you think you're going to make that team. When I needed some work in the gym on my stick skills, I would invite some of my colleagues down to shoot on me. Um, math teacher shooting on a phys ed teacher was very interesting. One of the guys would come down with his ice hockey stick and shoot on me. And I said, what are you doing with an ice hockey stick? That's nothing like a field hockey stick. He says, well, Koyak, you need it. Just, just mind yourself and let me shoot on you. And apparently it made me a better player. So thank you for that. And lastly, I want to thank everybody for being here tonight. But I also want to challenge the sports casters and the sports writers, similar to what DJ said at the end of her uh, speech. For some reason, people still compare female athletes to male athletes. I don't really understand that. I was watching a show where they were going to introduce the woman athlete of the year. And my mind started going. I'm like, who could this be? What athlete made it? This is the coolest thing. And the announcer said, she is the Michael Jordan of gymnastics. And I started to laugh. I'm like, when did Michael Jordan ever do a round off back handspring on a four inch balance beam and stick it? We have so many female role models out there now. Yes, I compared myself to the French Connection because when I grew up, the role models on the female side, they weren't as publicized. So I really didn't have a female role model to follow. But now for our young athletes, our young female athletes, how about calling them the next Abby Wambeck, the next Megan Rapino, or Alex Morgan of soccer? How about calling them the next Dawn Staley, Maya Moore, or Elena Daladon of basketball? What about Serena Williams, Naomi Osaka, and Coco Goff of tennis? Or maybe, just even maybe, the next Barbara Koyak of field hockey. Thank, Thank you. you. Our final inductee into the class of 2019 is Joe Horrigan. Born and raised in South Buffalo, Joe Horrigan attended Frontier High School and Canisius College and later graduated from the University of Akron. He's the son of former Buffalo News sports writer and Buffalo Bills Vice President of Public Relations, Jack Horrigan. Joe Horrigan has served in a variety of executive positions during his 42-year career at the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Prior to being named executive director in 2016, he was the Hall of Fame's executive vice president of museums, selection process, and chief communications officer. As executive director of the Hall of Fame, Joe oversees all aspects of the nationally accredited museum and its related objectives. 
He also administers the Pro Football Hall of Fame's enshrinee selection process. Regarded as the foremost historian on pro football, he is also the co-host of a popular weekly national radio show, Pro Football Hall of Fame Radio on Sirius XM. Horrigan is a regular contributor to NFL Films and NFL Network Productions and has been featured in several films and documentaries on pro football. During his long history with the Hall of Fame, he has been intimately involved in the development and implementation of several major renovations and expansions of the museum, including the Ralph C. Wilson Jr. Research Center. Horrigan has served on several NFL and team committees, including both the NFL's 75th and 100th Anniversary Committees, the Washington Redskins 75th Anniversary Committee, and the Cleveland Browns Legends Committee. He currently serves on the Black College Football Hall of Fame Advisory Board. He previously served on the Board of Trustees of the Ohio Museums Association and was co-founder and past president of the Professional Football Researchers Association and the recipient of that organization's Ralph E. Hay Award. He was elected to the Semi-Pro Football Hall of Fame in 1992 as an historian. He and his wife, Marianne, are the parents of two adult sons, Daniel and Sean. And tonight, Joe Horrigan is forever enshrined in the Greater Buffalo Sports Hall of Fame. Before we hear from Joe, I have two special messages from past inductees to share with you. Hey Joe, congratulations. Sorry I can't be there to help you celebrate on this wonderful evening on being inducted into the Greater Buffalo Sports Hall of Fame. I know you'll have a blast as you always do. You take care of yourself, God bless you, and again, sorry I cannot be there because I wanted to be to put you in a big headlock and give you a big hug. We will celebrate later. Love you, man, take care, have fun tonight, and congrats on the rest of the 2019 class. That's from fellow Hall of Famer, Jim Kelly. And one other message. Joe Hargan has always exemplified what is best, what is meaningful, and what is inspiring about the Hall of Fame. And now the moment has come when that oh-so-well-deserved honor is bestowed upon him. He is happy, and so are all of us who hold him in such high regards. Congratulations, Joe. And that's from fellow Hall of Famer, Marv Levy. Sponsoring Joe's induction is the Pro Football Hall of Fame, represented by President and CEO David Baker. We're going to let David say a couple of words here, and based on David's size, I'm going to the last guy who's going to stand in his way. So, David, you got it. You know, I think I was allowed to say something as a presenter uh, from one Hall of Fame to another, and it is to thank you for honoring these legendary and passionate Hall of Famers. You know, President Lincoln said, that a nation that does not honor its heroes shall not long endure. And in honoring your heroes, you're making our families closer. You're making Buffalo a greater community. And you're making our nation stronger. Uh, there's a lot of wonderful things that I know I get to do because of Joe's work at the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Uh, I get to knock on the door of those who come into the Hall of Fame. Uh, I get to give them the gold jacket, and I get to present their ring in their stadium in front of their fans. But I want to share with the Greater Buffalo Sports Hall of Fame a story that changed my life. Uh, we were at the Super Bowl in uh, San Francisco, and Joe and I and others on the Hall of Fame staff were having brunch with our Hall of Fame class. And we're about to go out and at the quarter break at the stadium, we'll introduce our class. And um, a young guy, 10 years old, asked if he can have his picture taken with me, probably just because I'm so big. Uh, when I was through, I took my lapel pin that says Pro Football Hall of Fame, and I said, here, let me pin this on you. 
And at that moment, his mother got in his other ear and she said, now you have to live a life of character. And to me, that's what each one of these people have done. They've lived a life of passion and perseverance, of hope and of character. So I know that Joe Horgan has lived a life of character. I have watched it, I have perceived it, and it has been one of perseverance and, and, and an absolute passion for excellence. Uh, as he will tell you, one of our Hall of Famers, Vince Lombardi, said that you can never achieve perfection. No matter how hard you work, no matter how hard you try, you can't achieve perfection. But as he said, if you fight for perfection, you might just capture excellence. So to all of the honorees, to Joe, um, thank you for capturing excellence. And to the Greater Buffalo Sports Hall of Fame, from one Hall of Fame to another, thank you for telling these stories, stories that help us all live a life of character. Thank you. See, now you know why I know how that guy that spoke after Lincoln felt. <laughs> Thank you. I am truly humbled and honored to be here tonight as a member of the Buffalo Sports Hall of Fame class of 2019. And to my classmates, I congratulate you, and I can't tell you how proud I am to be a part of this honorable class. And to the selection committee, I can only hope that you know how much this means to me and my family. As someone who's administered the selection process for the Pro Football Hall of Fame for many years, I know the difficulty that selectors make, that have to go through to make the tough decisions associated with electing a class. My shock that I'm selected is only exceeded by my profound appreciation. And although I appreciate the fact that it took the entire selection committee to make the decisions, I want to single out a couple who I know champion my cause. Therese Fortin Barnes, thank you for your support and friendship. Anyone who knows Therese knows that when she takes on a challenge, you best get the hell out of her way. She's going to get it done. Therese, thank you for taking on this challenge. Denny Lynch, over here, at, way in the dark corner where I see his hand there. Denny Lynch is my oldest and dearest friend in football. We met more than 42 years ago when I joined the Hall of Fame, and Denny had recently joined the front office staff of the Cleveland Browns, just a little north of us in Canton, Ohio. And that was following his stint with, dare I say, the New England Patriots. Forgive him. <laughs> Over our long relationship, Denny has not only been a good friend, but a mentor, an advisor, and a confidant. Thank you, my friend, for all you've done for me and helping me realize this great honor tonight. And I'd also like to thank David Baker for stealing much of my speech, uh, but also the fact, as you now know, he is the president and CEO of the Pro Football Hall of Fame and my former boss. But I'm proud to say that tonight, David isn't here as the Hall of Fame president and CEO or my former boss. He's here as my friend. And frankly, I know I'm here, at least in part, because of him. You see, I learned after I was elected to the Buffalo Sports Hall of Fame, I found out that Therese had encouraged David. Now, if you can imagine Therese intimidating that guy, she did. But she encouraged him to write a letter of support on my behalf. Now, you've just heard him speak. Now, folks, I can tell you firsthand, I know how convincing David can be. So with David in my corner, I will understand or I recognize that my chances of being elected to the Buffalo Sports Hall of Fame probably went from unlikely to better than even odds. And if it isn't already apparent, at six foot nine, David is my largest supporter. Also attending tonight's uh, celebration are several friends and outstanding teammates from the Pro Football Hall of Fame who are over at table number 10. And I'd like to thank them for being here. It certainly means so much for me to be able to share this with them because I have shared so much with them through the years. And there are so many other individuals I'd like to single out tonight, but time and Therese won't let me. 
But I did try to acknowledge some collectively or even individually in the open letter that I wrote in the program, but even that too falls short, short of sincerely conveying how much uh, people have met to me and all that they have given me in their support and love. My career in pro football began as a very, at a very year, early age. I was, it was, was mentioned in the video, and some of you know, my father, Jack Horrigan, preceded me in a career of sports, first as a journalist, then as the public relations director for the American Football League, and then as the vice president of public relations for the Buffalo Bills. When, uh, if, when I learned of this honor, I thought if there was only one thing that could make it even more meaningful, it would have been that my father would be here with me tonight. But obviously that wasn't possible. But I do know if he were here, he'd be as surprised as me. He'd probably say, you, you sure you got the right kid? I had 10 kids, you got the right one? But seriously, I, I really do know, with, and I believe this with all my heart, what he really would have said is that you've made your mother proud, because that's who he was. And my mother is here, all 92 years beautiful, my mother at Sable 13. I know every kid thinks his mother is the absolute best, but my mom, Liz Horrigan Augst, well, I'll tell you what, I know everybody thinks their mom is number one, but the difference tonight is, though, I have the microphone. So I'm here to tell you that not only is my mother the best, but if there was a Hall of Fame for moms, she would be a charter member. Mom, tonight I know I can speak for all of your children, your grandchildren, and your great-grandchildren and their families. We love you. My mother and father were the proud parents of 10 children. I'm the second oldest of this eclectic group, but as, a, as diverse as we are, I cannot begin to describe how fortunate I feel to have had such wonderful siblings. And even though two of my sisters, Eileen and Mary, passed away at very early ages, they, along with my seven other brothers and sisters, impacted me in ways that simply cannot be measured or explained. Jeremiah, Karen, Patricia, Jack, Margaret, Elizabeth, Kathleen, and if I forgot someone, I apologize. I love you all dearly. Thank you for always being there for me and for each other. There is nothing more important than family and the bonds that hold us together. And now, I want to share with you the impossible task I've faced these past few weeks. As I look for the perfect word or words to express how I feel about the three most important people in my life, my wife, Mary Ann, and our two sons, Daniel and Sean, I have truly struggled with this. To simply say, I love you, just doesn't seem to be enough. So, after considering all those special hallmark moment words out there, I've determined that the one word that might actually describe the enormity of my love is, in fact, the word impossible. For it is impossible for me to adequately express my love. And it is impossible for me to find the words enough to thank you for all you have given me, your love, understanding, encouragement, support, and when necessary, your forgiveness. And it is impossible for me to, ma to imagine my life without the three of you. Now, I want to close with just a few remarks about where I've been and what I've been doing for the past 42 years. And it's easy and it won't take much time. In 1977, I left Buffalo, New York to go to Canton, Ohio to work at the Pro Football Hall of Fame. I was first the Hall's curator researcher, worked my way through the ranks to a vice president's role, then executive vice president, and then retired in June as executive director. That's it. That's it. But as a result, I consider myself the luckiest guy alive because I have spent my entire adult life working at a job, at a place, with people that I truly love. And I truly do believe that the Pro Football Hall of Fame, not just because a six-foot-nine guy standing behind me, is the best sports Hall of Fame in the world. It is, in fact, the only sports Hall of Fame 
that is meant, as was mentioned in the video, has earned national accreditation from the American Alliance of Museums. There are more than 32,000 museums in the country, but fewer than 3% have actually been so honored. It is a great museum, but it is also much, much more, and if you've ever been there, I think you'll agree. It's the only Hall of Fame for sure that has three television networks as partners and broadcasts every year 11 nationally televised special events, including our enshrinement ceremony, which is covered by two national networks. Pro football, it is often said, is the consummate team sport, and it is. And the Pro Football Hall of Fame has always followed that model. At the Hall of Fame, we work as a team to fulfill our mission, which is to honor the heroes of the game. And everyone, everyone who ever coached, played, or contributed to this game is one of those honors, uh, was one of those heroes, rather, to preserve its history. And we do preserve its history, and it has a rich history. And it's not just sports history, it's not just pro football history, it's American history, it's social history. And much of it can be found in the Ralph Wilson Jr. Research and Preservation Center, which was made possible by our great friend Ralph Wilson, who is a Hall of Famer. And also, we, want, uh, our, we promote the values of the game. And you've heard from each of these other Hall of Famers tonight that those values can include such things as perseverance, teamwork, commitment, courage, and fellowship. And finally, as David said, celebrating excellence everywhere. And he did use a quote that I was going to use, but it's worth repeating because it was the great Vince Lombardi who was often repeated from many of his various motivational speeches. But he says that we are not perfect and we can never achieve perfection, but in the pursuit of that perfection, we might just achieve excellence. I offer tonight this head table, this table that is evidence of that excellence in the pursuit of perfection. Ladies and gentlemen, I am proud to have been a part of the mission of the Pro Football Hall of Fame for four decades. I am proud of all, all we have accomplished as a team, and I am proud to call my teammates friends. And I am proud to be from Buffalo, New York, and now proud to be a member of the Greater Buffalo Sports Hall of Fame. Thank you for giving me this very special day in my life. Congratulations to Joe, and congratulations to all of our inductees. How about one big, nice round of applause? We thank all of you for joining us on this incredible night to honor these wonderful sportsmen and sportswomen. Ladies and gentlemen, the class of 2019 will now process from the stage to the reception on the south side of the hall, led by past President Therese Fortin Barnes and the Greater Buffalo Sports Hall of Fame trophy. Once they have left the room, please join them on the other side of the hall for the reception. Thank you for being a part of this wonderful evening. We'll see you next year. Have a great night, everyone. Thank you.